The book of Exodus is filled with three great heroes, Moses, Israel, and God, most importantly. It also begins by describing the Israelites as slaves to Pharaoh to build his treasure cities, and then progresses on to watch the Israelites choosing to serve God to build his tabernacle for future treasure cities symbolized up in the next life. It's a beautiful pattern to watch um, our servitude go from mammon to God and what that requires. I love being able to see the ideas of servitude in our relationship with God to better emphasize what kind of allegiance we need to have for him. But our God is not one who forces us into servitude, but invites us. And the treasure cities that he offers are much greater than all the pyramids of Egypt. Initially, the book of Genesis begins the same with the beginning Hebrew word in the beginning. Genesis coming from the roots of genealogy, beginnings of Hebrew. And so Exodus was initially named, and these are the names because that's how the book begins. But later on, the name was changed to be Exodus. In Genesis, we're told that the Lord began the world. And in Exodus, the Lord begins his covenant people as a nation. Prior to that, they were being built up as a family. In Genesis, the Lord gives the command to multiply and replenish the earth, to bear much fruit. And in Exodus, we see the Israelites bearing that fruit and multiplying across the promised land. There are beautiful parallels between these two books. And even though it looks as if Moses is just going from one text to the next, as we go back and look at the timeline, we realize it's been well over 300 years since the death of Joseph when we step into the book of Exodus. Remember that as we looked at Joseph's timeline a few weeks ago when he was 17 sold into Egypt, 30 begins as the viceroy in Egypt, 110 as he dies. In between there, we're told little bits of information. For example, Joseph arrived in Egypt 430 years before the Exodus is what we're told in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. And we're also told, which is very helpful, that Joseph is living at a time when the Pharaoh loved him and worked with him, and yet 300 years later, that is no longer the case. So we say, look at Egyptian history. The timeline fits into this middle dynasty, and there's an intermediate or an period there that seems to apply. If we just go by strictly the dates in the calendar of the um, biblical text, it appears that this could be happening anywhere between the 12th and the 15th dynasties. If we look more at the histories, we realize that there's a great evidence that possibly Joseph, um, from the time of Joseph to the time of Moses, we have not only a change of conquerors, but the High Coast dynasty has come and gone. And many people have wondered if that was the dynasty that Joseph um, served under. In either case, these things really don't matter except for the fact that the Bible does have evidence historically, and so I don't want us to throw it out without some of these details. Uh, We're also told that by the time of um, Solomon building the temple, exactly how many years that was after the Exodus. So this Exodus becomes a new beginning of timelines for the people of the Israelites. As we look specifically at Exodus chapter 1, we begin by learning that the Israelites are multiplying in abundance, that they're blessed with lots of children, and the chapter ends with these marvelous midwives who are saved the day and are saving that posterity to in- continue to bless it, um, bless them with further posterity. We're also told in Exodus chapter 1 that when Jacob first comes down into Egypt with his children, he brings down with him 70 people. And we're told now um, that by the time they are about to leave Egypt, um, there are 600 soldiers. So this is an enormous growth for this 430-year age span, approximately. Now, many people have discounted the numbers in the Bible, and I am not one who has, um, don't want to emphasize a lot of this, but I just want to say one thing on it. Um, I had my um, mathematician son help me out on this, and over, if a woman was able to have approximately five children for these um, 12 generations over a 400-year span, 
you would be able to have a population large enough to have the numbers that the Bible is saying. So even though five children as an average seems very high for the ancient world, we're we told repeatedly in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, and then again in verse 20, that the people are increasing greatly, that it's more than the average birth, that our children are not dying, that the Lord's allowing us to live, even though we're in these terrible circumstances where we're slaves, where we're having to work long hours, when we're um, exhausted and our bodies are being tested, we are still fertile and we are able to bear children and they were able to be, be blessed by God. So even though some people throw out the story because of that and the numbers, I'd just like to say it could have been possible if it were five. I mentioned early that historically a lot of people put emphasis on the fact that the High Coast Dynasty was part of this time period. They were in full power of Egypt for only a hundred years, but partial po power for much longer than that. And the children of Israel are up at the top of the Nile River, at the northern part, um, right actually close to the border of Canaan or Israel, and Goshen is in this northeastern portion, and the High Coast Dynasty was there for a period of time. And they were these foreign kings, they're called the shepherd kings, who came in and took over and then were ousted later. All we know, whether it's the 12th dynasty or the 15th dynasty, doesn't really matter, but we're told in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1 that these foreign kings came in who did not respect Joseph's authority and Joseph's lineage and Joseph's people. And they are in uh, new um, people on the throne. And that's really about all the story we get in Genesis. But if we look at Jasher, one of the extra biblical texts that claims to be written in ancient date, we read, all the men of Egypt and Goshen were called um, by the Egyptian rulers to come and participate in a project to build together. He says, quote, all ye men of Egypt and Goshen, of the children of Israel and of the inhabitants of the cities who are willingly willing to build with us, shall each have his wages given to him daily. And most of the Israelites think this is wonderful. And it is true that in the Nubitian dynasty, we have evidence that they all wanted to work together, that this was part of the Egyptian tradition that had been passed on. So this joint venture that initially began with the Hebrews working side by side with their Egyptian neighbors changed. And of course, over time, the taskmasters overruled and they lose their freedom and they are left to build alone. The book of Jasher tells us, though, that the Levites were not involved. Let me read to you from Jasher 65, verse 32 and 33. The children of Levi were not employed in the work with their brethren of Israel from the beginning unto that day, for their going came from Egypt. For all the children of Levi knew that the Egyptians had spoken all these words in deceit. So this is interesting, but during this time that they're multiplying and building, uh, we learn in Genesis that they are still being made strong, and they're able to build these, what G King James Version translates treasure cities, but other translations use the fact that they're storage cities, that they are supply cities, and the theme of Exodus is work. Whatever we're doing, whether we're working for the Egyptians or we're working for God, we're working for Moses, we are servants and we are learning how to work. It's a wonderful symbol and I think it helps us to better understand the law of consecration when we realize we all are in here to work. But unfortunately, as you know, um, that work habit changed. And the um, Hebrew historian that wrote, you know, 1500, 1800, well, 1600 years or so after this time recorded, one of those Egyptian sacred scribes told the king that about this time there would be a child born to the Israelites who would bring the Egyptians' dominion low and who would raise the Israelites and he would excel all men in virtue and obtain glory that he would be remembered through all the ages. And which thing was so feared by the king and then we go to the text of Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, where we're told that the Pharaoh charges all his people saying, every son that is born, you shall cast into the river and you shall, every daughter you shall save alive. And this is where the story of Moses comes. And of course, I mentioned the three heroes of the entire book of Exodus were Moses, the um, Israelites, and God. But in the first chapter, our heroes are two midwives, and their names are Sipara and Pua. 
in verses 15 to 22. And we're told that the Lord blessed them for saving these little boys and lying to the Egyptians about the fact, sorry, they just delivered too fast. We can't, we can't kill them. Don't blame us. And by doing that, they're blessed, it says in King James, with a house. But in, in Hebrew or Greek, that's a, a little bit, both the Septuagint and the ancient Hebrew text, we learn that this is households or posterity, that they are too blessed with, with children and able to raise up great families. And this is the account that begins the story of the Levite family who do have a son named Moses during this time, well, who is called later Moses, who is saved by um, a wise, wise mother and a wonderful oldest sister who act as God's servants. When we look for these stories in the restored scripture, I was quite surprised to find them so heavily saturating the Book of Mormon. Because, in my opinion, the Book of Mormon is talking about a much later period of time. We're already into the first temple period. We're at 600 BC, and we're a thousand years after this time, and yet there are 19 verses spread all through the um, book from 1 Nephi to Ether that refer to Egypt, that refer to this time of captivity. And there's one verse in the Doctrine and Covenants as well. It's in section 105. I will soften the heart of this people as I did the heart of Pharaoh. Now, this is very interesting because it's not until we read the King James translation that the Bible remind, assures us that God is not hardening Pharaoh's heart. God does not harden anyone's heart. That is the adversary who does that. God softened Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's heart finally to let the children go. And um, we are so blessed to have the Joseph Smith translation, in, especially in Genesis and in Exodus as well. As we look, though, at what restored scripture teaches us about the Bible, we can prove that these things actually happened because we have a second witness. And that may not mean a lot to you, but I go to these Society of Biblical Literature meetings where the Bible is debated by biblical scholars every year. And I am so grateful to be able to have in my heart a firm witness that there are two voices that testify that these things did happen. And the Book of Mormon is loud and clear, a witness that they came to pass. Abinadi is one of them, as he speaks out in Mosiah 12, 34. I am the Lord thy God, who hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of bondage. And in Ether, we learn about Joseph. In chapter 13, verse 7, it reads, For as Joseph brought his father down into the land of Egypt, wherefore the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should not perish. And what a blessing to have this extra information on the seed of Joseph, that we can learn more about the tribes of Israel and about our responsibility as we learn that the, in the title page of the Book of Mormon, that one of the purposes of the Book of Mormon are to gather Israel. And our prophet has told us that that is our responsibility now, our chief responsibility to gather Israel on both sides of the veil through our temple work and through our efforts to gather those who want to know more light and truth. I pray that we may do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.